paleontologist from Mountain View, California. And he's the chief science officer of the SENS Research Foundation. And when I, I saw this, I thought, well, that looks like an acronym and I got to look up and see what that means. <laughs> so it, it's, it was, uh, stands for the Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence. And senescence, of course, is the process of aging. So uh, the, the SENS Research Foundation is a biomedical research charity that performs and funds laboratory research dedicated to combating the, the aging process. And Dr. DeGray is the editor in chief of Rejuvenation Research, the world's highest impact peer reviewed journal focused on interventions in aging. And he is uh, also a fellow of both the Gerontological Society of America and the American Aging Association and sits on the editorial and scientific advisory boards of numerous journals and organizations. So we, we are really happy to have him here to speak to us today about the SENS Research Foundation on the forefront of biomedical research into diseases of aging and healthy longevity. So we'll turn the meeting over to you, Dr. Gray. Oh, thank you very much, Guy. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. It's always great to speak to a new audience. And um, I see that, uh, you know, there's plenty of you here. I am going to try to cover quite a lot of ground today because I guess that I, the audience, you guys are quite diverse. And um, also because Howard, who I don't see actually in the um, uh, audience, but maybe he's here. Um, Howard John asked me to cover a few things which I only sometimes cover. So, I'm going to keep my uh, monologue Audrey, fairly <laughs> short. Oh, you are? Very good. Um, oh, yes, there you are. Uh, so I'm going to keep my um, uh, covering basically what we do at SANS, why we do it, um, you know, what's important about it, how, how it's all going. And particular, I'll certainly talk quite a bit about how sensory emerging and indeed rapidly growing ecosystem within the longevity movement. Um, but I'm also going to talk about quite a few other things, uh, much of which I think I'll leave uh, to the end and uh, discuss more uh, extemporaneously rather than with prepared remarks. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about COVID a bit because of what I view as the potential for COVID to have a bit of a silver lining when it comes to the health of the um, And I'm also going to talk about the, um, uh, there's some aspects of this that I believe may be of interest to humanists in general. I gather that's a big theme with you guys. Um, one of which is cryonics. Of course, you are sitting at the global epicenter of cryonics with Alcor being based in Scottsdale. Um, and I'll also talk a bit about death with dignity and how that, how that um, relates to the work that we do. All right, so first of all, I shall share my screen and get my PowerPoint going. Wait a second. Um, uh, um, somebody has to enable screen sharing. I'm getting host disabled participant screen sharing. All right, uh, working okay. on that right now. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Yes. That'll do. All right. All right, here we go. So, yes, so um, rejuvenation biotechnology, that's what we work on. And uh, as you can tell from that, that, just those two words, what we're doing is medical research to develop ways to make people genuinely biologically younger again, not just to slow down the clock of aging, but actually to turn it backwards. So, First thing I want to tell you is a little bit about what, bit about what we don't work on. Um, this is what we don't work on. We don't work on longevity. And that is something that I tend to highlight quite um, vocally, quite loudly at the beginning of my talks, simply because if you look me up on Google, then you will find that I do a great deal of media uh, interfacing. And um, the media, of course, are paid to be sensationalist. And they try to uh, make it sound as though I am actually interested in longevity for longevity's sake. 
you know, I get called things like the prophet of immortality, uh, which is a little bit frustrating sometimes because it often causes a lot of the audience to um, have an, a completely unreasoning uh, or at least you know, unjustified level of ambivalence about the work that I and Sense Research Foundation do. Nobody is ambivalent about medicine. Nobody thinks it's, uh, you know, a, 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 that there are, it's double-edged sword whether we uh, cure Alzheimer's, for example. They would just unequivocally like it to happen. So I do want to start here. I guess the reason why the media get away with this distortion of what we do is because of the second bullet point I've put on this slide, namely that um, medicine has a side effect of longevity, obviously, because most people die from being sick. And the medicine that we're working to develop is likely to have a really large side effect in terms of longevity, because the um, things that we work on, the health problems of late life, are the number one reason why people die from being sick by a, a large distance. Um, just, just touching briefly on COVID now, um, of course, we know that the elderly are extremely um, you know, disproportionately affected by COVID. And of course, they are somewhat disproportionately affected by all infectious diseases. Seasonal flu is no different. It's just particularly extreme in the case of COVID. Um, so there, you know, it's a case of, um, yes, the actual proximate cause of death is an infection, but for sure, there's something that's gone on in the body over time that has caused people to be more susceptible to it. So let me be clear. I do think that this side effect of longevity as a result of staying healthy is a good side effect. I think that people are entitled to carry on living when they're healthy and they want to carry on living, but it is just a side effect. All right, so um, let me just make, can I get my slides working? They're being a bit recalcitrant. Here we go. All right, so um, a large part of the reason why I emphasize this so strongly at the outset is that when you get it wrong, in other words, when you think about longevity in isolation as the goal of this work, rather than thinking about it as a side effect of health, it's very easy to get um, fixated, I would say, on the potential difficulties that might arise, the problems that might be created as a consequence of solving the problem we have today, the problem of aging. So, I spend my entire life answering questions along the lines of, oh dear, woe we put all the people, or won't dictators live forever, or won't it be boring, or how will we pay the pensions, or doesn't death give meaning to life? And you will kind of notice that these questions are not, not raised when the topic of conversation is Alzheimer's disease, or cancer, or heart disease, or any of the other specific things that go wrong with us late in life. So a lot of what I have to do is remind people that, yes, these are perfectly valid things to ask, but the answers have to be stated, the discussion has to occur in the context of the removal of the number one cause of suffering that humanity experiences today, namely the health problems of late life. And yes, I have very, you know, um, robust specific answers to these questions, how we can avoid these problems occurring at all. But even insofar as they might be, we might fear that they might occur, um, we have to have a sense of proportion about them. We have to recognize that they are, it is you know, inconceivable that these problems could be as bad in terms of the amount of suffering experienced um, as the problem we have today. All right, so now for some science, or at least some introduction to science. So I'm, a, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm a technologist. I'm the kind of guy who tries to solve big problems. And I have very clearly in my mind and always have had that the way that you go about solving hard problems is by starting by asking the right question about the problem, to find the problem well, breaking it down appropriately. And I believe that this is the place that we, we, sh we must start if we are interested in Bringing, bringing aging to an end. In other words, developing medicines that bring aging under complete medical control, the same kind of control that we have already today over most infectious diseases. 
because we do, right? I mean, 200 years ago, even in the wealthiest countries in the world, more than a third, roughly 40% of all babies would die before the age of one from things like diphtheria and tuberculosis and such like. And that is pretty much gone now. And indeed, it's been gone for quite a while now in the developed world anyway. And it's going rather rapidly in the rest of the world. And the way we did it was really, really elementary. We just, you know, first of all, we figured out that hygiene is a good idea. And then we, um, you know, we invented really quite simple medicines like vaccines and antibiotics, even mosquito nets. Of course, you're aware of the number of lives that are saved. So an, a, a very important question to ask here is, why is aging so different? What makes the health problems of late life so much harder for medical researchers to overcome than the problems that we have overcome so comprehensively already? Most people think they know the answer. This is the problem. Most people think that it's really simple. The answer is just that so many things go wrong with us late in life. And they go wrong at more or less the same time as well. So they interact, they exacerbate each other. So don't worry, you're not supposed to be able to read this slide. The point I'm making here is obviously just that there are so many, right? Uh, and, you know, sure, that's for sure, that's true. And definitely it makes it harder. The sheer complexity of the problem is a huge barrier to bring the health problems of late life under complete medical control. But what I want to start by telling you is that that's actually not the main answer. The main answer is a little subtler than that. And it starts from what aging actually is. So here's another problem that really held us back over the years. The problem is that if you ask 10 people what aging is, their definition of aging, you will get 10 different answers, which if you think about it, is really weird because let's face it, aging has been the number one preoccupation of humanity since the beginning of civilization, right? And yet, you know, we haven't, we haven't gravitated to an agreed definition of it. It's crazy. All right, so I use this definition here, and I'm giving you this not only in order to make sure that we're all on the same page for the next hour, but also because I want to emphasize that aging is not an enigma. This is to demystify aging, to show you what aging is, that we really do understand it fundamentally pretty well already. All right, so aging is this thing here I'm showing you, this combination of these two processes. So the left-hand process goes on throughout life. I really mean that, it starts before we're born. And it is the, it is the process where damage is created in the body as a self-inflicted consequence of the body's normal operation. So meta metabolism is the word that biologists use to denote the entire network of processes that keep us alive from one day to the next. And Metabolism generates changes to the molecular and cellular structure and composition of the body. And, um, you know, those changes accumulate. And that's why the changes, it's appropriate to call the changes damage, because the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of that change without significant decline in function, whether mental or physical function. And that's why not a lot goes wrong with our bodies until middle age or later. You know, when you're 40 or 50, you are pretty much as functional as you were when you were 20. Um, but the body's only set up to tolerate a certain amount. And so eventually the amount of damage that accumulates exceeds that threshold and things start to go wrong. That, of course, is the right hand of the two processes I'm showing you here, where damage engenders pathology, where the chronic progressive uh, health problems of late life emerge and become increasingly severe and eventually kill you completely. That's all aging is, those two processes. So remember that. Now, why is it so important to get that right? Well, the fundamental reason is because it helps you to understand the problem with what I'm showing you on this table. Here, what I'm showing you is the answer that most people would give if you ask them a very simple question. You ask them, in what ways can somebody be sick? So can somebody get sick? Most people will say, well, let's see, there's infections, that's column one, communicable diseases. Then there's genetic problems uh, that a very small number of people get as a consequence of their parents having the wrong genes. That's congenital diseases. Then there's the big one, column three, 
the chronic progressive diseases of late life, like Alzheimer's and most can almost all cancers and uh, atherosclerosis, osteoporosis, all those things that I put up in really small print a few slides ago, right? And then most people would say that way out in the stratosphere, there's this fourth category of ways to be sick, which is called aging itself. And that consists of, you know, these rather poorly defined things like frailty. And in most people's minds, aging itself is completely different from diseases, just a completely different category of phenomenon, such that implicitly it's kind of off limits to medicine. It's just kind of natural and inevitable and universal and just don't even think about doing anything about it. That's the popular view. And that's, this is what that popular view leads to. If you focus only on column three, in when you're looking at health problems of late life, and if you consider column three to be a type of disease, just like column one, just like infections, then what you're going to try to do is develop medicines that rather resemble the medicines that have worked so well against most infectious diseases. So in other words, you're going to directly attack the actual phenomenon, the pathologies of late life, and you're going to try to eliminate them from the body. You're going to try to cure Alzheimer's and such like. And, um, you know, lo and behold, it hasn't worked. Why hasn't it worked? Well, it doesn't take very many milliseconds to look at this really simple diagram to see why it doesn't work. The pathologies of late life are side effects of being alive. They are caused by something that's continuing to accumulate, this thing called damage. So by definition, anything that attacks the pathologies of late life directly is bound to become progressively more ineffective as the person gets older. It's just brain dead to go this way. So, you know, first question is, why are we still making this mistake, right? And one answer might be, well, there's no alternative. And I'll show you shortly that that's not true. But the other option, of course, is, well, you know, maybe it's the right way to go, but it isn't because of the error in that table I showed you. This is the corrected version of that table. If you look closely, you'll see that all four of the columns are the same as they were before. Only big difference is the location of that big thick black line. I've moved it to the left so that it's now between column two and column three. Now, why is that so important? Two reasons. First thing is what I just said. The things in column three are nothing like the things in column one. There is absolutely no reason whatsoever to assume that the same kinds of medicines that have been so successful against the things in column one are also going to work against But the other thing, which is perhaps even more important, is that this demonstrates that there is no difference to speak of between column three and column four. In fact, there really is no biologically meaningful difference at all. The only difference between column three and column four is semantic. The fact that we have that the things in column three are the aspects of aging that we have chosen to give disease-like names to. That is all. And once you recognize that, of course, it becomes in completely impossible immediately to take the view that the things in column four are off limits to medicine, because no one's gonna try and say that the things in column three are off limits to medicine. What it does instead is it makes you think about what kind of medicine. And that's what people have done. So I am by no means the first person to realize, broadly speaking anyway, what I've told you so far. In fact, more than a century ago, people started to think this way, just a few people. And the result was the field of gerontology, which emerged in the early 20th century. Though it has, you know, forebears earlier than that, certainly. Um, so gerontology is inspired by the living world, by the fact that in, if we look at different species, we see that there's a huge amount of variation between different species in terms of how fast they age, how rapidly their metabolism generates damage. And so, of course, that was inspiration, inspiring. It suggested that maybe if we study the process, the left-hand process here, where metabolism generates damage, if we study it really, really hard, eventually we may understand it well enough to be able to exploit this variation and to actually somehow make metabolism of humans run more cleanly with some kind of therapy so that damage accumulates more slowly. And of course, that means that the threshold at which pathologies start to emerge because of the right-hand process is postponed. 
Fantastic. That would be wonderful. Uh, but you may have noticed that despite a century of effort, the gerontology paradigm has also completely failed to postpone the health problems of late life. They are, they happen to us still, only, sli only slightly greater in age than before. And this is why complexity. You thought that the pathologies of late life were complicated. You see nothing when you look at metabolism. This, what I'm showing you here, is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism actually works. And you can see it's, it's quite nasty. I mean, for any of you who have ever written software will immediately see that this is the ultimate nightmare of uncommented spaghetti code. There is just no way in hell that we are ever going to be able to pick it apart and somehow stop it from doing the, um, the things we don't want it to do, the uh, creation of damage, without at the same time having unintended consequences that stop it from doing the things we needed to do to keep us alive. It's just not. But luckily, that's not the end of the story. Remember what our goal is here. Our goal is to separate metabolism from pathology, to let people carry on living, in other words, performing metabolism, without at the same time, eventually uh, going downhill. Now, what I've shown you is that we cannot separate metabolism from pathology by separating damage from pathology. Geriatric medicine is not going to work. And we also can't do it by separating metabolism from damage. The gerontology approach also is just not going to work. But we don't need to do either of those things. Instead, we can go in and eliminate the damage, remove damage, repair damage periodically. That's what I'm calling the maintenance approach. We can leave the two component processes completely alone. We don't have to slow down the creation of damage and we don't have to defend the body from having too much damage. We can simply periodically re remove the damage and thereby uncouple the two processes from each other. And we don't even have to remove the damage particularly perfectly, just as long as we remove it enough of it, rapidly enough, so that it never reaches the level that is pathogenic. And of course, the reason, I mean, you may think it's a little arrogant for me to call it the common sense approach, but not really, because the fact is we already do it successfully. Here is a, 100 year old car, okay? And it's working every bit as well as when it was built. Why? Preventative maintenance. People didn't stop the rust from happening. People also didn't wait for the doors to fall off and then put them back. What they did was they periodically removed the little amount of rust and such like that was accumulating so that the doors never did fall off. And we see this with any man made machine. So, you know, why would it not work for this really complicated living machine called the human body? So in other words, in summary, what I've told you so far is that aging is not a phenomenon of biology, you know, an emergent thing like consciousness, for example. It's a phenomenon of physics. Comprehensive preventative maintenance just works. It already keeps simple machines working just as well as when they were built, irrespective of how long they were designed to last. That's the key thing. Now, the body is far more complex. So the only thing I haven't done so far is to explain to you whether this approach is practical. It may be the common sense approach, but I've already explained that metabolism is viciously complicated and so is pathology. So maybe damage is also viciously complicated and this is just not gonna be possible, even though it is the common sense approach. But it turns out, no. Um, I'm gonna skip that slide, I don't have time. Um, turns out, no. If you think about it closely, and this is really, I would say my main claim to fame in the field is realizing this about 20 years ago. If you look at it closely, yes, there are many, many, many types of damage, but they can all be classified into a small number, a manageable number of categories. And I use this classification into seven major categories that you see listed on the left-hand side of this table. Now, you may think, well, what's the point of that? What, how, why is that useful? You can always put several thousand things into seven boxes. Um, but the reason is the list on the right hand side. For each of these categories, there may be many examples within the category, but there is a generic approach to actually doing the damage repair. So just for illustration, let me talk about the first one here, cell loss. What is that? It's simply cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. And um, what do we do to fix that? Stem cell therapy, of course. 
we put cells into the body that we have pre-programmed into the right state so that they know what to do to, um, you know, to, 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 to differentiate and replace the cells that the body is not replacing on its own. And different organs in the body have different types of cell, so we need to do different stem cell therapies. But the thing is, all stem cell therapies have a, a great deal in common. So once we've got a couple of them working well for a couple of different organs, getting the next one working and the one after that will be much easier and faster. That's why this, this, this classification, this modularization, shall we call it, of the problem into these sub-problems is so important. All right, so briefly, let me tell you what's been happening lately in, in regard to this. Um, and of course, it took a little while to get going. It took me maybe 10 years even to persuade people that this was a good idea. And I'll come to that in a second. But over the past several years, uh, Science Research Foundation has been quite successful. We've pushed out quite a lot of academic papers. I, I put here just a small selection of them. And I've chosen these ones because they were real breakthrough papers that um, essentially opened up whole new avenues of research that had previously been given up on because people thought these things were too hard. So this covers several of the different um, uh, strands of sense that I just listed in the table earlier. Um, and as I said, yes, this has now become mainstream. It took me maybe 10 years to get my colleagues in the field of the biology of aging to really understand what I was saying and why it was practical. But now people have been reinventing the idea and you know, restating it as if it were original you know, all over the place. This paper in particular is, um, uh, worth mentioning because it's been so prominent. Um, it was by far the most highly sought. And here they split aging into nine categories rather than seven, but that doesn't mean they identified things that I'd overlooked. It was just a different way of doing the classification. And as you can see on the right, there's these corresponding repair therapies. So it's it's very much a mainstream orthodox way of thinking about aging and its medi and medical. Uh, ways to fix it. Um, I'll just briefly talk about the ecosystem. I said I would. So um, for the longest time, it was really, you know, we were a lone voice in the wilderness in here. We were beavering away as best we could with whatever support we could scrape together from donors, but it was really slow. But then over the past five years or so, things have really changed we've been able to get to the point of sufficient proof of concept for some of these technologies that the more courageous end of the investment spectrum, the investor spectrum is starting to get interested. And so we've been able to spin out into startup companies, I'm listing them here, um, covering several of the themes that we have been pursuing for several years. And of course, the utility of that, from my point of view as a scientist, I'm the least entrepreneurial person you'll ever meet, but the utility is that investors just write bigger checks than donors do, simple as that, which means that these projects are now moving forward very much more rapidly than they were before when they were relying purely on the philanthropic support that we could provide. And the, what makes it even better is that it's by no means just us anymore. Um, so I've just totally given up on trying to update this slide, which I first generated a couple of years ago. Um, I instead defer to the website that you'll see listed at the bottom right of the slide, agingbiotech.info, where one of the more active angel investors in this space has done this enormously valuable public service of creating a relatively comprehensive account list of the startups in this space. There's way over a hundred of them now, and that's very incomplete even now. Um, everyone's piling in. So this is the next big thing for sure. Um, so I said I'd talk about COVID. Let me start here. I mentioned about the disproportionate effect on the elderly. Well, you knew that. Um, one thing to highlight here is it's not chronological age I'm talking about, it's biological age. In other words, if you, for whatever reason, have a relatively early onset of some one or other chronic condition of late life, this type two diabetes, for example, or cardiovascular disease, you're also at greater risk from COVID. But here's something that I want to focus on very strongly here. Altruism. Most people think that it's every man for himself, that at the end of the day, you know, people are much more interested in their own welfare than anybody else's. And there's plenty of evidence for that, let's face it. 
But the, the, COVID, the situation with COVID is, to my mind, very strong evidence to the contrary. What we've seen is that even though the younger population are pretty much resistant to COVID, I mean, they get it, they just don't see much harm, much danger from it. Nevertheless, they have been putting up overwhelmingly, the overwhelming majority of them, with a really extraordinarily onerous amount of limitation on their way of life, um, you know, even though it doesn't matter to them in terms of their own welfare. Really what they've been doing is they've been doing it for the benefit of the elderly. And that's hugely important because what it says is that there are votes in a manifesto commitment to spend taxpayers' money putting more effort into longevity research, into taking people who were born a long time ago and making them biologically younger again so that they are less likely to get sick from the next pandemic or whatever. And that has been unclear because the fact is when you ask elderly people where medical research money or medical money in general should be allocated, should be emphasized, by and large, they will say, oh, you should focus on the young, you know, um, you know, they've got more to gain, which is completely circular, of course, because the elderly have just as much to gain if we can actually pull this off and bring aging to, the, to an end. So now is the time to be really making that case very vocally, and I'm certainly doing so. All right, so that's the end of what I wanted to say as a kind of monologue. Um, I just wanted to mention this book um, that I wrote several years ago, Ending Aging, which talks about the science of rejuvenation biotechnology in a lot of detail. It is, however, written for a general audience. In other words, it does not rely on, um, you know, any bio biology jargon per se. But on the other hand, it's very, very thorough. Uh, nobody has complained that I've cut any corners here. So it's pretty dense and you won't get through it in one sitting, even if you are a trained biologist, but um, it's to the test of time. Um, people keep saying, please write a sequel, but there's really no point because all of the enormous amount of progress that's been made is pretty much the same progress that we predicted would be made. So that's very good news, of course. It means that the paradigm is likely to continue to stand the test of time, which is very much um, what we need to know in order to have confidence that we are going to actually get to the finish line and really bring aging under control fairly soon. So I will stop there and just start to talk kind of more extemporaneously a little bit about the two other themes that Howard mentioned that I should probably touch on. One of them is, let me just stop sharing my screen. Uh, stop share, there we go. Um, one of them is um, cryonics. And the other is death with dignity, because these things come up a lot in the humanist community and indeed in many other communities, and they are extraordinarily important areas. Let me talk about death with dignity first, because this is something that makes a lot of sense today, but that is often mischaracterized as being somehow in conflict with the kind of work that I do. So let's remember what death with dignity is all about. It's all about minimizing the suffering, first of all, that someone with a terminal illness actually experiences. And secondly, the additional suffering that they experience by virtue of knowing that their loved ones are suffering too, you know, keeping them going, um, the dependence that they have. Uh, when you ask, elderly, when I ask elderly people what they're most scared of, about getting old, it's always uh, becoming reliant on their loved ones. So let's be clear, there is nothing at all in conflict between that attitude, the, the idea that people should have the option to call a halt to their own uh, chronic progressive decline, um, and the work that we do. Because what we're trying to do is to allow people never to embark on that downhill slope in the first place. We want to keep people in a purely youthful state of health in every way, both mentally and physically, and we believe we can. 
And if we could do this, then the whole question of the whole dilemma of whether someone's life should be ended prematurely in their own interests and in the interests of those around them, um, you know, that question goes away. And of course, I'm happy to discuss that further if anyone's interested. But I want to first of all just finish my own remarks by touching on cryonics, which is something that Howard also suggested I should mention. I've been a strong proponent of, the, of cryonics for a long time. For anyone who's not familiar with it, and you certainly should be given where you live, um, cryonics is the practice of taking someone who has just been declared legally dead by a suitable medic um, and freezing them, taking them down to very low temperatures, liquid nitrogen temperatures, in the hope that future medicine might be able, able to revive them. The logic of this essentially arises from the fact that as medicine has advanced over the past decades and more, we have had to redefine legal death because we've been able to bring people back from increasingly close to the brink. In particular, when your heart stopped, that was that some time ago. And it became a little embarrassing that quite a lot of people were walking around perfectly healthy who had been declared legally dead, obviously wrongly. Um, so that's when the concept of brain death became incorporated into the definition of legal death. And everyone is perfectly aware that, that redefinition process is likely to be repeated to some extent um, as a result of further progress in medicine. So the idea of cryopreservation, cryonics, is that if you catch someone and arrest their decay as soon as possible after they have been declared legally dead, then they may not be actually dead. And you may be able to revive them in the future. I think that that is completely logical and sensible. And furthermore, it actually intersects with the death with dignity um, concept. Um, the, 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 the kind of buzzword, the moniker that has been coined to, um, to describe that intersection is the word cryothanasia, which I'm sure you can work out a combination of cryonics and euthanasia. Uh, the idea that if someone is on a slow but steady downhill slope, and especially if that downhill slope is characterized by dementia, then the sooner they get cryopreserved, the better because they can be morally dead, so to speak, um, uh, with their brain having essentially turned to mush before they become legally dead if you don't do that. Um, and again, I can talk about that more. All right, so I think I'll shut up for a second and see how Howard and Kay and, and Oliver want to organize the rest of the session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aubrey. Um, yeah, so if, uh, if people have questions, um, please, um, as Mary Jo just did, post the questions in the chat. That's a good place to do so if you're on a phone or a tablet or computer. Um, another way to do it is, um, let me see if it's available. Um, yeah, uh, if you tap on your screen and use the raised hand, raise hand feature, um, that will make it easy for us to call on you. Um, or if you don't have any of those other options, um, just go ahead and let us know that you do have a question and uh, we'll um, address you when we're able to. So, uh, go ahead with Mary Jo's question in the chat, Aubrey. Um, okay, let me just see what it says. Um, all right. Yeah. All right. So yes. Ah uh, yes. Thank you for um, uh, Mary Jo. Thank you for reminding me about those dark days when nobody understood a word that I was saying. I think I may have already alluded to the fact that it took me about ten years to actually um, convince anybody that I was talking sense. And um, the dates that you're talking about there are very much right in the middle of that period when I was getting quite a lot of acrimonious opposition. Um, so yes, my PhD is from Cambridge in biology. Um, my undergrad degree, however, also from Cambridge, is in computer science. 
And indeed, my first field of research was artificial intelligence. I was working in that area from, let me think now, 1985 through to about 1993 or four. Uh, and then right, right in the middle of that period, I met and married a biologist. So I um, learned a lot of biology by accident, uh, but I also switched fields because I learned that almost all biologists felt that aging was not interesting and not um, right. So um, yes, I um, so so as as I said, I did get my uh, PhD in biology uh, for the early work that I did in this space, um, focused on one of the seven what what became later on the seven strands. Uh, that's the uh, problem of mitochondrial mutations. Uh, but in um, roughly. 2000, uh, well, in 2000, I had this big idea that comprehensive damage repair might be the way to go and published on that um, starting in 2002. And by about 2004, 2005, uh, some of my um, colleagues uh, started getting a little irritated that so many journalists were asking them what they thought of what I was saying when in fact they didn't really know or understand what I was saying because they hadn't taken the trouble to read my papers. And uh, yeah, the result was eventually there was a bit of an acrimonious exchange, one part of which, as uh, Mary Jo had mentioned, was um, published in MIT Technology Review. And um, the competition in question uh, was actually kind of my doing, a competition of my doing. Uh, uh, the editor of Technology Review didn't think much of my ideas. And between the two, but he, but he was also unable to get anybody to come out in print explaining why they were wrong. So he and I kind of hatched this plot to uh, offer a small amount of money to encourage people to do so. And a few people did. And well, sure enough, the um, uh, quote that um, Mary Jo has put in the chat is part of what they've said, but they also said, that the um, critics had failed to prove that my approach would not work. And sure enough, uh, well, as I said, that paper that I, put, uh, that I highlighted in my talk came out only eight years later. In fact, after I had so comprehensively um, shown that nobody could actually demonstrate that this damage repair idea was idiotic, um, you know, after the dust settled, it, it, people started to pay more attention. Um, so, um, uh, I'm going to repeat question. the questions so that, um, they're recorded in the video as well as being on, on the text. Um, yeah, good job. Thank you, Oliver. Yeah. Uh, what is the best way to help the effort for someone who is science literate, but not a trained biologist, not rich or skilled at acquiring large amounts of money? That's a question from Jason. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Jason. So, yeah, everyone has different opportunities here. I mean, um, you know, the, the organizers of this group have just done one thing that's very important to do, which is to organize a session where someone like myself can come and educate people and get them up to speed. A lot of people can do that, even if they don't have money or time or biology. Um, then, you know, actually, you shouldn't really understate one's skills at acquiring large amounts of money. Something I always like to say, which is not entirely frivolous, is that the poorer you are, the more people you know who are wealthier than you. So it can be, you know, the trickling up can actually occur, um, you know, step by step. Uh, essentially, if everybody who recognizes that this crusade is not a pipe dream and also is the most important crusade for humanity, if everybody who realized that were able to spend some of their time just talking to their friends and colleagues and family and persuading them of, of the same thing, then the field will just go faster. So advocacy is a huge, huge part of this. Some, uh, if anyone's talking, they're on mute. So uh, the next question is from Gail. Um, how do you do telomere control and what are suicide genes and what is extracellular matrix stiffening? 
All right, so it's always a challenge to give short answers to questions like this, but I'll do my best. Um, telomere control basically means stopping cancer cells from extending their telomeres. So telomeres are the DNA sequences at the ends of chromosomes, which get shorter when a cell divides, and cancers only kill us because they figure out ways to overcome that and to maintain telomere length. So basically, the, it's all about stopping cancers from doing that. And there are various approaches to that. Um, suicide genes are genes that, that, that encode proteins which kill cells. And of course, it seems like a bad idea for a cell to make a protein that promptly kills the cell, but that's kind of the point. Suicide gene therapy, therefore, is used in the laboratory already and coming to the clinic as a way to get rid of certain cells. Essentially, what you do is you arrange things so that the suicide gene only makes its protein in the circumstance when you want the cell to die because the, the cell is already doing other things that are diagnostic of being badly behaved in some way or another. Finally, extracellular matrix stiffening. Okay, the extracellular matrix is a kind of lattice of proteins that exists surrounding our cells and giving our cells their physical properties, our tissues. So for example, uh, the skin, you know, the reason we get wrinkles, or uh, well, one of the big reasons anyway, is because the skin is less elastic later in life. And that is because of stiffening. Um, so we see it also with presbyopia, with the inability to see things close up. That's because the lens of the eye becomes less elastic. Uh, and um, then the most life-threatening example of this is arteriosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. Um, so the major arteries become less elastic, and that is a major driver of age-related high blood pressure, which, of course, has many knock-on effects. So stiffening, and it turns out that the chemistry underlying all of this, that stiffening of all of these different places, is basically the same. It's a chemical reaction between proteins and sugars, and it's pretty well understood, but doing something about it, actually reversing it, repairing it, is really, really hard. Thank you. Um, Howard asks, um, there's a segment of the transhumanist community that is very interested in the possibility of the transference of human consciousness into a computer or AI robot. Um, it just moved. Or AI robot of some sort. Is that feasible? Would a robot with a mind uploaded from a person actually be conscious? Or would it be, or would it just be a simulation no more alive than a rock? How would we know the difference? Right, this comes up a huge amount. Um, and people are certainly interested in whether uploading is possible, this transfer of consciousness. Um, people are also very interested in a couple of questions arising from that. One of them being, would the upload have consciousness at all? You know, would it be a conscious entity? And perhaps subsuming both of those questions is, if we could do it, would it actually constitute the same uh, a different version of the same person in the same way that you are you are still the same person as you were before you went to sleep last night or would it be a copy like a night like a, 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 a an identical twin or a semi-identical twin um and well to cut a long story short there are many different proposals out there for how one might actually achieve uploading at all uh, uh, the transfer of consciousness from um, it's existing hardware into new hardware. And the details of those proposals are enormously important in answering the other questions, in particular the question of continuity of identity, whether it would still be the same person or just a copy. And there are some proposals in which it's pretty hard to argue that it would just be a copy. It's pretty clear that it really would be the same person if we could do it. So this actually comes to another a question, which doesn't come up nearly often enough is, do we really want to do it? Do we actually really want to be in different hardware at all? And um, the answer to that actually comes down to, can we achieve the same results by other means that somehow sound safer or easier or preferable in some way? And of course the answer is maybe. If we can really, truly, totally defeat aging, 
And if also we continue to make progress against our other risks of death, the ones that don't have to do with how long ago we were born, like road accidents, you know, with self-driving cars and such like, then it becomes, to my mind, considerably less obvious that there is any actual motivation to try to develop uploading. You know, why don't we just stick with what we know? Cool, thank you. Um, Jason has another question. Um, when Jason's 93-year-old grandmother died this year, um, they spoke at her memorial. One of the things they said was, she died too young to the shock of some of the audience. Though to be fair, they also got some positive comments afterward. Their intent was to get across that any age is too young to die if the person did not, did not want that. Any suggestions for a better way to handle situations like that? <laughs> to be honest, no. I think that's a brilliant way to handle it. A lot, a huge amount of what you have to do to get across the idea that aging is actually quite a bad thing and that we might actually be able to do something about it is shock value to catch people unawares, which sounds like exactly what you did at the funeral. So I congratulate you. You found a really good form of words there and you should use it more. You, and the, 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 you know, I think you were the same person who asked about what you should, what you can do if you um, aren't a biologist or a billionaire. Well, there you go. You've got what it takes. It's, it's, I mean, let's remember the fatalism about aging that exists in humanity is rather deep seated for a rather good reason. Namely, as I mentioned earlier, aging has been you know, the number one preoccupation of humanity since the beginning of civilization, since we realized aging existed. And yet we haven't been able to do anything about it. But of course, there has been a rather you know, undignified succession of people claiming to be able to do something about it and being wrong. So it's really rather easy to just say, well, everyone in the future is also going to be wrong, especially this crazy guy with the English accent and the beard. So the fact is, you've got to somehow get people to take a little more time than that in evaluating what's going on and indeed why it's important, why it's valuable. So I think what you just did at, your funeral, at that funeral is a really good example to everybody here. Cool, thank you. Um, Kirk has a question. Is there any progress on preventing the demyelination of nerve cells? Yes, there is. Um, and um, let's see, where do I start with this one? Okay, well, Best thing to do is perhaps to explain to everyone else here what demyelination actually is. So um, nerve cells, as I'm sure you all know, are connected to each other by uh, things called synapses. But in order for the brain to work the way it does, nerve cells often have to be connected to other nerve cells that are a long way away, especially in the brain. And so the shape of a nerve cell is very unlike the shape of most cells. It consists of a cell-like you know, blob uh, called the cell body, but then also this thing called the axon, which is this very, very long extension out of the cell that goes in the general direction of the cell, the other nerve cells that the cell wants to connect to. And that axon has to carry an electrical current in order for the nerve cell to do its job. So myelin is a material, a protein that's laid down on the outside of a, an, a, of a nerve cell's axon as a kind of basically insulation to make the electricity actually flow. And uh, demyelination, you won't be surprised to hear, is the loss of that insulation or the, you know, the fragmentation of that insulation. Now, the process by which that insulation is laid down is called myelination and it involves other cells in the brain called oligodendrocytes, uh, which um, transform themselves into things called Schwann cells. I won't go any further with that. Um, but the point is, yes, this does break down. And there are a number of ways to go about it. Uh, fixing it, but essentially what it comes down to is reinvigorating oligodendrocytes, making them, make, maybe ha just having more of them or making them yo internally younger so that they can operate in an old environment. And also it involves improving the environment. So in the inside of the brain, you don't have the blood in the normal way. You have this thing called the cerebrospinal fluid, which is the kind of you know liquid that um, the brain cells are bathed in and just like the blood that cerebrospinal fluid becomes contaminated with stuff and generally a harder place for a cell to live 
So in all of these ways, we are um, we, we want to fix up that process so that myelination can be better. And there has been quite considerable progress. Actually, um, probably the leading group in this area is a group from my alma mater from back in Cambridge in England, um, a group of Robin Franklin. Uh, but yes, there's plenty going on in that space. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, scrolling back up because there's because several came in. Um, uh, Kay asks, uh, the interventions that you describe to manage aging seem that they would be expensive and thus not available to everyone. Working on stopping the effects of aging would lead to questions of accessibility to the treatments. Oh, yes. In fact, they do indeed lead to that question. I'm, I apologize, I think, to Howard, who actually suggested that I should address this in my original remarks. So thank you, Kay, for bringing it up. Um, so, yes, this is, uh, I guess, this question is second only to the question of overpopulation in terms of how often this is up. And of course, it's a really important question, especially in the USA, which have a um, you know, private health system and perhaps a greater problem of inequality. But let me be clear, countries with a single payer system still have this problem in a big way. But we have to ask, why do they have this problem? Why does society put up with inequality of access to life-saving medicines, uh, to important high-tech experimental you know, new medicines for the elderly? And the fundamental answer is very, very simple. The, today's medicines for the elderly basically don't work. All those medicines do is they modestly, if anything, prolong the period of low quality life at the end of life that was already being experienced. They are basically just spending a lot of money um, getting no real significant or not, not a substantial benefit in terms of what people want to achieve with medicine. So there just, aren't, there just isn't the public support for spending highly elevated amount of taxpayers' money to get these medicines out there to a larger proportion of the uh, affected population. But that is not going to be the case for medicines that do work. Medicines of the sort that we're, we're, we're developing will genuinely keep the people who were born a long time ago, the chronologically elderly, in a state that's biologically young, both mentally and physically. And that, first of all, means that Prevention is what? Prevention is better than cure. It's, these medicines are going to be expensive, but not nearly so expensive as the medicines that are being um, are, are being developed that exist today. Um, I mean, I'm sure all of you know that the vast majority of the medical budget of any Western country goes on people in their last few years of life. Um, but it's not just that. It's also the indirect costs. The fact that the kids of the elderly, I mentioned, this, I mentioned dependence early, earlier, right? The kids of the will be that much more productive, um, you know, as a result of not having to spend time looking after their sick parents. Um, and of course, the elderly themselves will be in a position to continue contributing wealth to society and generally fulfilling themselves, um, rather than just being consumers of large amounts of wealth. Uh, so one way or another, I mean, some of us have you know, a variety of opinions about whether elections are reliable ways to get, the, get good things to happen. But... The fact is, you don't even need to worry about the electoral imperative to um, make sure that these things are available free at the point of delivery to everybody who needs them. Um, because you can just talk about the economic imperative. The sheer mercenary economic argument is that it would be economically suicidal not to um, make these things available irrespective of ability to pay. It will, and, and furthermore, the, this logic is going to be understood, it's being discussed already, it's going to be understood and acted upon well before the medicines actually arrive. There's going to be a period of anticipation of at least a decade, during which all of the need for, you know, p appropriate political decision making and investment in infrastructure and training and so on will all shake down. I appreciate it. Um, Howard has another question um, asking about supplements. There's a lot of hype and a lot of wasted money on all sorts of uh, expensive supplements. Yet, might there be some that are promising to increase healthy lifespan, slow the process of metabolic damage? CoQ10, green tea extracts? Yeah, very little. So, um, 
<laughs> yeah, very little, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, different things may work for different people, but nothing works for anyone to a great extent, to anything like the extent that the kinds of things that I work on will be able to achieve. Essentially, the only ways in which we can optimize um, our aging over and above just doing what your mother told you, in other words, you know, don't smoke, don't get seriously overweight, uh, have a reasonably balanced, varied diet. Apart from that, the only things that we can do have a very minimal effect. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of the more um, conspicuous ones these days, like metformin or rapamycin or resveratrol, these things are often essentially ways to trick the body into thinking that it's in a famine, to essentially conceal the amount of calories that are being consumed. That tends to have a modest effect. And the reason it's so popular is because it had a really big effect in short-lived species like mice or rats that are studied in the laboratory. But in long-lived species, I'm afraid it's not by any means the holy grail. All right, thank you. Um, Gail has a question. Um, the, she re recently heard that children born today will be will live to be 103 to 105. Does this mean we're really going to do some of the things on your chart, such as stem cell replacement? Okay, so I'm going to answer this question in two parts. First of all, the first sentence. Yes, it is being widely touted that people, children born today will live to 103 or 105, but the basis for that conclusion is completely broken. Um, essentially what people are getting there, but the way, the way that people are getting those numbers is by extrapolating from the trajectory of life expectancy improvements that have been seen over the past decades. And that is just completely wrong. Life expectancy numbers, the headline numbers that you hear every year are actually calculated in a very um, arcane statistical way. They don't refer to, for example, the average lifespan of people who died last year or of, of people who are alive today or anything like that. Um, it's much more complicated and probabilistic than that. It's all statistics. Um, and it turns out for reasons that I probably shouldn't spend time going into that that statistical calculation will be mathematically impossible to do in a world where the aging process has been brought under comprehensive control, which I think we are within striking distance of doing, like we probably get there within the next 15 or 20 years. Um, so just forget about the numbers that you hear uh, uh, applied to people, children who are born today. They're complete fiction. However, if you want to know what the fact is, how long people will live on average who were born today, it's actually going to be crazy, crazy long with high probability. Of course, I don't know, it's the future, but very probably children today are gonna to live far, far longer than that into their thousands, if not more. And the reason for that is indeed because we're really going to do all of the things on my chart. Um, we're going to, we're, we're already in the position where quite a few of those things are in clinical trials and some of them are even reaching the clinic, actually, actually reaching patients. Pretty much all of them are going to be in clinical trials within the next few years. There's then a period where they, that we're going to have to work out what happens when you combine them and you do a lot of different things to the same people at the same time. That's going to throw up a few more problems, we're fairly sure. But one way or another, this is coming. And it's gonna be coming with, a, it might very well come in time for quite a lot of people on this call. Cool, thanks. Um, Howard has another question. Um, I assume you don't want to get too political, but does it make sense to spend over $700 billion a year on the US military with the the aim to kill people and break things as Rush Limbaugh has defined it and spend only a small fraction of that on biomedical research and um, universal access to health care. Um. Yeah, right, yes. Um, well, of course, uh, you're right, Howard. I don't want to get too political, but I don't need to because of what I said earlier about COVID. Fact is, we have seen what happens when you don't put the, the right amount of money into medical research. If we had actually reacted to, even 20 years ago, if we'd reacted to like SARS and MERS, the, the um, bullets that we dodged 
um, as, a, as a society over the past. If we had reacted to those by realizing that we had dodged a real bullet, then you know things would be very different today. Yeah. What what bullet did we dodge? It was simply the latency. In the case of COVID, on average, there's quite a few days between the point where you become infectious and the point where you exhibit symptoms. And during that period, of course, we're passing um, the virus on. That period was much shorter in the case of SARS and MERS and avian flu, and that made all the difference. But next time around, it may be longer. And for that matter, next time around, the actual infections themselves may be more lethal. SARS and MERS were certainly a lot more lethal than COVID. So, you know, in a way, it's kind of a good thing that finally we got a, a an infection out there that really became a proper pandemic and actually, you know, had a devastating, devastating economic toll, because it will no longer be possible for the key decision makers in the world to actually be blind to the risk that they are taking by not allowing medical research to proceed as fast as it can, and by underfunding it. Cool, thank you. Um... Howard continues, um, is it not critical to vote for political leaders who see the need to reverse our um, uh, budgetary priorities and fund human needs, including Medicare for all or something equivalent? Otherwise, there's little chance to develop the political will for something like a cancer moonshot or, develop, or developing the modalities you're advocating if they are not universally available regardless of ability to pay. Well, right. So, I mean, I think you know, the first few words of, your, of, of that passage, Howard, really sum it up. At the end of the day, I can talk to politicians until I'm blue in the face, and some of them may be really nice to me. But the fact is, what they actually do is completely irrelevant. It could be independent of what I tell them. What they do is determined entirely by what by their perception of whether it's going to get them re-elected. The only good thing about politicians in general is that they're extremely predictable. They only have one goal in life, which is to get re-elected. So, you know, that's why I've always worked on public opinion rather than public policy, you know, because public, public policy will simply follow public opinion. And that's why we just have to carry on getting the word out. Cool. Um, how can you get the pharmaceutical companies on board with this research? That's from Kurt. Not too hard. So, uh, are they, the, the, <clears throat> so the assumption that I believe Kirk is making that underlies this question is that the pharmaceutical industry, and well, the medical industry in general, is not going to like any of this because it's preventative. And the medical industry makes its money out of people who are sick. Um, <clears throat> keeping sick people alive and getting them to pay a lot of money. And, you know, simplistically, that sounds, sounds very logical, but actually it's not true because really the only thing that pharmaceutical companies want is to make money and they can make money from whatever the public wants to pay for. So, you know, there's a reason why we have these, uh, uh, these few, but very, very conspicuous counterexamples to the generalization that um, you know, medicine have to be treatments rather than prevention. The counterexamples are obvious. You know them all. Um, you know, statins. They keep cholesterol down. They are given to people who are not yet sick. Similarly, ACE inhibitors. They are given to people with high blood pressure who are not yet exhibiting any actual symptoms, any actual path pathological consequences of high blood pressure. So you have to ask why. The answer is very simple, the public get it. The public appreciate that the um, benefits, that, that these really are kept canaries in the coal mine, the, the um, level of your cholesterol or your, high, or your blood pressure really are indicators of how soon you're going to start exhibiting bad news, bad, bad symptoms. And if you can normalize those things, you are going to postpone those symptoms and people like that. And of course, that filters through through all the system of insurance and so on into actual actual money for the people who make those things. So our goal here 
in order to get the pharmaceutical companies and the whole medical industry on board is very simple. It, all we need to do is get the public on board and the industry will just follow the money. Cool. Um, the next question comes from uh, either Angel or Angel. I'm, I haven't met this person, so I don't know uh, how they pronounce it. Um, how will transhumanism compete with life extension? Yeah, I'm going for Angel. Um, well, it doesn't really compete. I mean, um, in fact, you know, I very often get called a transhumanist. I was actually the inaugural recipient of a prize given by the World Transhumanist Association. I think it was called something like the H.G. Wells Award for Exceptional Contributions to Transhumanism. Um, I don't like to call myself a transhumanist uh, be because I f personally feel that um, the way to get people to understand the value of this work is to emphasize its continuity with work that they're already supporting, supportive of. In other words, medicine in general, right? I, to emphasize that this is just medicine that we're doing. This is just medical research. Um, and we wanna keep people healthy. It's just that we wanna keep people healthy that who thought they could never be. Whereas transhumanism, the actual word sounds like it's kind of deprecating Human, human, the human condition as we know it today, it's not. It's what transhumanists actually do is they celebrate the potential of future technologies to continue the progress that's been made in humanity's quality of life, as well as quantity of life, um, as a result of past technology. It's just a, in, in, in continuation of that. So I just think the word transhumanism is bad advertising, but I do not think that there's any essence of competition there. I think that it's all about using technology of one sort or another to help people. Cool, thanks. Um, Debbie has a question. Uh, besides politicians, the medical insurance companies will determine if anyone but the wealthy will have access. Uh, do these organizations have plans for this? <laughs> I wish. So yes, so of course the insurance companies, at least in uh, the USA, um, are these intermediate intermediaries between the patient and the actual um, provider of the therapies, and they do need to be able to actually perform that role. And so I have the good fortune that I quite often get invited to speak to uh, insurance companies um, about this kind of thing, and I am always emphasizing exactly that. Essentially, well, I give talks with titles like Anticipating the Anticipation. So what I mean here, of course, is I'm referring to that period I mentioned earlier in response to the question about inequality of access. Um, there will be this period of maybe 10 years, maybe longer, before the therapies actually arrive or are available to anybody, but when everybody, well, more or less everybody knows they're coming and the fatalism and skepticism that still prevails is just going to evaporate because of the amount of progress that's already happened in the laboratory and because of the, the optimism that will be expressed not only by me, but also by all the other experts in the biology of aging who have so far been considerably more reticent. So that's going to happen. And when it happens, that's when the shit's going to hit the fan when it comes to insurance, because ultimately insurers have products that are bought by people on the basis of how long those people think they're going to live and how healthy those years are going to be. And that expectation is what's going to change. At the moment, the overwhelming majority of humanity believe that they are likely to have a health span and a total lifespan only slightly longer than the, that of their parents. And that belief underpins what kind of life insurance policies they want and health insurance and inheritance arrangements and pensions and everything. Big ticket items, right? Um, and that's going to change more or less overnight. There's going to be this extraordinarily sharp tipping point when the Oprah Winfrey's of this world start talking about this properly. And when people are suddenly going to realize that they're probably going to live massively longer than their parents did. 
and, and in health, in good health. That's going to enormously change what kind of ways they want to spend their money on pensions and insurance and so on. Uh, oh, God, yes. The companies are damn well better be ready. And that's what I keep telling them. And they're kind of beginning to listen. You know, 10 years ago, it was a case of they were terribly polite, but I more or less knew that the following day they were going to get out of bed and it was all a bad dream and they would get on and do what they were doing anyway. Now I think they're beginning to pay attention. Cool. Um, does anybody else have a question? Thank you. It was a great talk. I agree. Um, well, my pleasure. Great questions as well. Uh, any other comments or questions from uh, anyone? Thank oh, you, I see Aubrey, one. for, I learned for doing oh, this. Appreciate I it. do see another question. Someone, so, someone has a, which is the most important question of all. Yeah, uh, Jason asks, how, uh, how, how do we contact you if we have other people who might be interested? So by far the best way to contact me personally is by email, and I'm putting my email address in the chat right now. Um, but of course we have a website, sense.org, um, which is full of information. Um, it's written for every audience from experts all the way through to complete novices. And it's, um, well, we think it's pretty good. Uh, we think it's got pretty much what, everything you wanna know. It tells us all about, of course, news about what research we're doing, what research other people are doing that's important, progress that's being made, what we wanna do next. There's a contact form if there's anything you wanna know that you can't find on the website itself. And we're very good at responding to everything that comes through there. And of course, there's a nice big friendly donate button. And I should actually emphasize that we're in the middle of an end of year campaign right now in which some of our larger donors have put up matching funds so that at this point, every small donation that we receive, where small means up to $10,000, is going to be trebled. Um, so that's perhaps a bit of an incentive if anyone's thinking of supporting us financially at all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aubrey. Um, it was a good presentation. Thanks a lot. Well, I'm glad you liked it. Thanks very much to everybody for listening. And I look forward to any comments or questions that any of you may have going forward. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.